Hey guys, how's it going? So, I'm at work right now. Obviously, where else would I have a, a chalkboard in the background? But um, I wanted to show you my classroom before I leave so I could document it. And it's small, but it's still, I like it. I think it's kind of a cool classroom. And I just got done teaching my little kids, my itty bitties. And oh my gosh, seriously, they're a handful, but they're super cute. Uh, and, <laughs> and they've learned now to say, well, when they have to go to the bathroom, they say BB instead of pee pee, because we've, we've only really done letters and we're just starting to read. Um, but they're like, BB. And I was like, oh, you have to go pee pee? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, BB. <laughs> okay. So they're, they're really cute. Okay, so I wanted to tell you about my weekend. I went and took a tour of the DMZ. And I guess I shouldn't assume that people know what the DMZ is. It stands for Demilitarized Zone, and it's like the little span of land between North Korea and South Korea. North and South. And um, I don't know why it's called demilitarized, because there's military all over. There's uh, North Koreans, South Koreans, and Americans there. But you have to have your passport, and you have to be in professional dress, and it's like a, it's a tour that you can only take photos at certain places. And, but it's, it's still really cool. Like, we were driving down the road, and we passed this dynamite, dynamite box, and it's the only road that leads from North Korea to South Korea. And this box is more appropriately called a building. It's a building full of dynamite. So in the event that North Korea attacks South Korea, they will ignite this dynamite box and um, destroy the only road leading into Seoul. So I was like, holy cow. Like, the North Korea and South Korea are at a state of war right now. They, they're not in warfare, but there's open and declared war between the two countries. And even though South Korea provides North Korea with almost 80% of their food, though ever since the, that boat, that ship exploded, I think the amount went down to 60%. But, you know, I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy to be in this area that is that is controlled by both. Well, all three parties, I suppose. And I learned a lot of like interesting things. We were, if, if we were on the, um, the path, and if you seriously strayed off the path by a foot and a half, there was a, a sign that warned you of landmines all over the place. There, the whole place is riddled with landmines. And the North Koreans had dug like a number of different tunnels from North Korea to Seoul, and so far, four of them have been discovered, but as recent as 1990, one of those tunnels were discovered, and we went through the third tunnel, and the North Koreans had, like, coated the walls with coal, so if it was ever discovered, they could claim that it was a coal mine, even though, like, a geological survey proved that it wasn't, and they still deny having ever built or tunneled through, uh, you know, made any of these tunnels, but obviously, they can do like analysis and see what the direction of the explosions have happened. And like, it's clear it came from North Korea, but they just deny everything. It's so crazy. And there was a story about how the Americans um, didn't like a tree because it was blocking observation of like North Korean military. And so they cut down this tree in the 70s and then the North Koreans killed two Americans with axes because they cut down this tree. I was like, how the hell did we not go to war for that? But come to find out, the president, you know, he apologized. He apologized. I thought that was even more ridiculous than the than they actually killing Americans over this tree. And it was just intense. It was so intense. Um, and I learned, well, I knew that South Koreans have to serve military time. Like, it's a mandatory military service for 22 months, all the men. Um, and my male students are, are always complaining about that. But North Koreans have a mandatory military service of 10 years. 10 years. And then the women serve too, but it's not mandatory. But normally women serve like up to six or seven years because of the pay. That's the only way they can make an income. So it was just really interesting. And I'm really glad I t went on this tour before my before I left because it's so uniquely Korean, you know? I mean, it's the DMZ for crying out loud. 
And I went with my ex-boyfriend, Todd, and it was really fun. Like, we had a great time. And he's, really, you guys, he's so damn funny. Um, that There was this one point in the video where they were talking about uh, an animal sanctuary and how the DMZ has, I guess, turned into an animal sanctuary of all these exotic birds and cranes and stuff. But like I said, there's like landmines everywhere. It's like littered hundreds of thousands of landmines. And so I was like, what kind of animal finds this as a sanctuary, you know? And Todd, he said the funniest thing. He said, it's, it's a sanctuary to all kinds of three-legged beasts. <laughs> it's like, damn it, you're so damn funny. So it was really good to spend some time with them before I took off. And um, we just had a really good time. Then we had some Greek food and I hadn't had Greek food in over a year. And uh, it was so good, it was so good. I had a yiddo with some tzatziki sauce and it's pretty tasty. Though it was made of pork and not lamb, so it wasn't quite authentic, but anyway. I wanted to um, tell you guys about a lesson that I have in one of my books, uh, What a Life, High Beginning. And this is just um, stories about kind of remarkable people that we may know or we may not know. And it includes Mother Teresa, who's amazing. I really like that lesson. And uh, Mozart and lesser known people. Um, what's his name? Uh, damn it. It's good. Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe. He was a Native American athlete in the early 1900s who won two gold medals in the hardest um, Olympic, I don't know, Olympic event, the decathlon and the pentathlon. And he was d like named the best athlete in the entire world. And anyway, so like really cool lessons, right? And, uh, and they're just like an hour long lesson, but I wanted to tell you about this, this guy, Dr. James Berry. And um, so he was born in 19, uh, in 1795 in London. And he was a trans man. He worked for the army as a surgeon. And he, I mean, he was in the army for 45 years. And he eventually became inspector general, which, you know, a really, really like elite position. And he traveled all over the colonies um, of Great Britain. He went to like Corfu and Malta and Jamaica and South Africa. And then he became inspector general of Canada. But no one knew that he was female bodied. Um, if anyone ever commented that he didn't have a beard or on his small hands, he was five foot tall. He was like a renowned swordsman, and he would just fight whoever brought attention to his more feminine features. And um, he, he kind of pioneered a lot of medical treatment for disenfranchised people, especially like prisoners, uh, particularly prisoners of war. And he set a really high standard of medical care that um, persists even to today through in the British military. And so he eventually died, as what happens. And when they examined his, examined his body, they discovered that he was female-bodied. And he, he was a doctor, but he still had to share quarters with other officers. And he would, al often, he would always make them leave the room um, in order for him to change. So despite all of these like glaring kind of signs, right, that he was trans, uh, no one no one thought he was and then once he discovered he was the british military was like eh, he was a great doctor so they didn't they didn't change anything they i mean they still his burial plot is under his name james james berry dr james berry and they just didn't make a big deal i mean and that's huge i mean female if women couldn't go to medical school let alone serve in the army and here he was like pioneer and a, a renowned surgeon worldwide and I thought it was really cool and it's kind of cool that it's a lesson of mine you know um, it doesn't actually say he's trans and it doesn't use male pronouns but I mean I think we can all agree that if you live your entire life as male then in bind and present as male and go by a male name that is not entirely based on um, career objectives right so, anyway, that's kind of cool. And I guess that's it. Okay, guys.
Take care. Bye.